Oh, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. It's Grant Abbas for you. We're here with Tim. How are you going, Tim? I'm good, thanks, Grant. How are you? Hi, listeners. How are you all? Yeah, it's good. I was about to say, oh, it's frustrating. You know, every time I use Zoom, they've got a new feature on it. And I think it's frustrating. Uh-huh. Then I think, oh, my God, I'm, I'm exactly the same. So you put stuff in and things are continuously changing. So which really brings us around the uh, Protector 2.0, which we're going to have a look at. Uh, plenty of time to ask us questions, either um, in the Q&A or the chat. Um, Tim and I are there and you know, I've done uh, probably at least about 20 or 30 of these and I'm sure Tim's done quite a few as well. So, yes. so from where we started, we're learning a lot. Um, I uh, had a chat, Michael, come on a little bit later on, but uh, his partner, Rod, is up in uh, is up in Brisbane at the moment and uh, they were just in the mediation with... Uh, trustee in bankruptcy, and uh, the client had used uh, this really weird protector. It's uh, I forget who sells it, but uh, we'll be ripping through that in the course uh, coming up in July. But I, I just didn't understand what was going on myself. So there's no clarity. And, and I think the work we've put in, all of us have put into the protector too, um, is certainly going to stand us uh, in good stead as we go down the track. So I'm going to lay out everything today and get Tim's feedback on all of it. Um, just a, a few things from um, our perspective is um, you may not have seen it, but we won the Startup of the Year in the Australian Digital Technology Awards. So thank you all for those of you who voted for us. Brilliant. I think probably more in, important for us was that uh, getting the sixth uh, overall in the Wealth and, and Self-Managed Superannuation Funds. So... We're in a good, pretty good day there. Um, all of you, and you'll see on the right-hand side, a prepayment of super contributions, um, a tax, uh, a year-end tax gift. Um, so what I've got there is, um, we'll go through the strategy. I've got a couple of case studies. Um, and for your clients, they can get up to $102,500 per person as a tax deduction. Um, and of course, that needs to be aggregated with employer stuff. And it's even higher still if you're doing catch-ups as well, which we'll have a look at. Uh, but importantly from that, I've also built um, some uh, client communications for you and, and how to do the strategy. So um, that's something that you might want to take. And um, if you want, Tim, you know, give to your um, crew as well. It's a really nice little one. Sounds Obviously, good. Obviously, starting the 1st of June, it really kicks in. It's really just using a contribution suspense account, but I will be going through a whole lot of variations uh, on that one, and uh, that would be great. The other one is I really want to impress upon you, and uh, it's up to you, but uh, doing that that course, if possible, from the 19th to the 21st of July. If you're tied up at that time, it doesn't make any... It, it's not a really big issue. I mean, it'll all be online, uh, later on in terms of modules, there's 14 modules there, but certainly if you can make it to that um, session, I think it's 1950, uh, but from that uh, you'll end up uh, moving towards certification as a um, succession asset protection estate planning advisor association advisor, which uh, is going to be certainly, it'd be great to be one of the um, initial intake uh, on that. So. I'd certainly, if you're going to invest in anything, this is going to be probably for me is going to be the cheapest, the least expensive course. They're definitely not cheap because there's obviously a lot of value in there. Um, it's going to be the least expensive course you'll ever get for the value return you'll get in the long run. So make sure you can get that. Um, if you've got any issues, just contact Travis at lightyearcom.au. Anyway, let's um, let's go around. Um, in terms of that um, that whole SEPEP, that succession asset protection estate planning, obviously, um, many of you have seen me turn my hand from self-managed to uh, SAPEP, and and the reason I do that, self-managed is obviously a, a a small but important part of it. Uh, but really, you know, I I've converted myself. You know, I was one of the first ones to see the value in self-managed. It's probably only been in the last five to 10 years as I've got older, uh, probably, um, that the, the family becomes a lot more important and more importantly, protecting family wealth becomes a lot more important. Um, divorces rear their heads. Um, in our game, we all know what litigation can happen at any, any point in time. Um, and then we've got estate planning as well. So, you know, in terms of this, um, 
Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. I'm having a bit of a, um, a meltdown there. But in terms of me, I, I see this as a really uh, big way and, and we're obviously down the innovators. So I, I'd say that you're in that um, innovator area there, Tim, as well as, as many of uh, the rest of you, are certainly in that early adopters. And, and that's that's where all the spoils of the market are. And uh, if you have a look at that, we're, we're all in a really good position for that. Um, the In terms of that space, um, I won't go into that much, but certainly the, the litigation area um, and the lawyers are come in at every angle. Australia's got more lawyers per capita than any anywhere else in the world. In fact, California is second to uh, Australia and believe it or not, New South Wales is, is number one. <laughs> Um, so it's crazy. So that's, that's, there's obviously, and, 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 you know, many of us have been caught up in one way, shape or form in, in litigation, whether it's uh, just a small matter, parking fines that we don't believe, you know, we, <laughs> we uh, actually got caught, and that's happened to me before on the Gold Coast, but then you get, you get caught going through. But from our, our perspective, we just want to make sure that uh, we've got uh, a layers of protection for our clients. Um, and the way that I look at it, and that's why I always have a chat, and uh, certainly on your trustee week, um, Tim, it's going to be absolutely important when we talk to the insolvency practitioners um, and the family lawyers to find out exactly um, how they attack these sort of structures and the success they have, uh, particularly you know, when we have a look at some of the cases, because... Once you find that out, then you can actually start to, you know, it's like anything, if if someone's attacking you from the, the northern area of the castle and they're doing it successfully, then I suggest that if they retreat, that you go and build and fortify that area. So it's a continual basis for doing that, which is which is quite exciting. Um, so when we have a look um, for us, I mean, the, the four key areas that um, I believe are, are in play and again, I'd, I'd encourage all of you to do your own um, asset protection and, and use, for example, mm -hmm. the castle. I know you've gone and still going through it. Tim, how are you finding it? Yeah, brilliant. I'm actually updating my wills myself and Lindell's and um, using a few things I'm doing, like pushing to, um, you know, breaking point, not that it is breaking, but like what Grant has put together mm -hmm. with the... Uh, wills of testamentary trust with bloodline provisions. Because like what I'm doing in my family is if I die, and obviously most of our state, most of our assets are not in our state, as you know, Grant always speaks about, it's in family protection trust, but there will still be something residual possibly. So if I die, it goes to Lindor, if Lindor dies, it goes to me, but then anything will then go to Savannah. But if we all die in a car crash, I then want some half going to my side of the family, half going to Lindor's. Yeah. So... I'm tweaking all of that, putting all that together. So we've got our primary, secondary and tertiary beneficiaries and uh, everyone will see pretty soon in about six months and change GPS, a new app that helps you to lay this out for clients. And then what I'm hoping to do is push a button and that'll just feed straight through into like your docs version two and um, assist with putting this together. So doing all the R&D for my end grant to make it easier for everyone. Well, look, I think it's really important for all of us to go through that because, I mean, you have a look at that, that number one there. Uh, litigation. Um, we all know that that you know fair work is. Um, I, I shouldn't say it's. It's very easy for any of your employees, and in fact, you know, this is one of the reasons so many people offshore mm -hmm. because they don't have that fair work issue. It's not about super. It's not about saving tax, but it's just having to deal with all of the the fair work. Um, and Australians are going to have to go through. Um, Australian employers are going to have to have. Um, a, a big look at this and expect to see a lot of fair work cases. I think the, the big areas we're going is uh, people being forced to come back into their offices, you know, when they've just enjoyed working from home and they've been productive. Um, you know, can you force people to go back and, and work in the office? And I think that that's something that that, that whole area is fundamentally going to change. On top, top of that, we um, can see now, obviously, through the budget, they looked at uh, providing... Um, sort of some relief for the ATO small debts, but you know ATO is not not exactly backwards coming forwards in terms of um, collecting their money. I mean there, there's certain string that they'll do, but you know they don't mind doing litigation. ASIC I think is is terrible because someone who's got an ASL or authorized rep, 
they can virtually come in and <laughs> knock you off and you've got no real well you've got right of recourse but it takes about two to three years and then after that you know your whole reputation's gone anyway mm. local government i think we've all all been caught in that one um tony's not on at the moment but he's just had a lot of success in uh, one of his clients uh suing uh the local council and it was a lot of money they spent in terms of uh, legal fees uh because the the trees outside on the council stripped um, the roots had gone underneath and damaged all the foundations of the house. So again, um, and, and then you've got your neighbours and you've got your partners. So there's there's never ending um, uh, instances of where people can uh, litigate you. Um, what have you found anyway, Tim? I mean, amongst your clients and stuff like that around the litigation side. I tell you, I've... I talk about this all the time. Anyone that's heard me speak, I always draw the diagram of risk and assets, the line down the middle, and show how to keep them separate. And you know what? Unfortunately, you can't, even though I know what a client needs to do, and I think we're very good at explaining the value of it, before we were as good at doing this, about 10 years ago, I remember a conversation with a client, and I recommended we did some asset protection, and here's a, an older client, one of these ones kind of thinks they know best, yeah. running management rights. And he's going, oh, we got, we got insurance. We don't need to spend this money. It's not going to waste our money on this. And I said, look, at least you're aware of it. I really think you should, but up to you. Um, six months later, his wife rings me. Um, this guy's had a mental breakdown. Some mm -hmm. young lady came home, drunk, high heels, mm -hmm. slipped on the stairs because she was drunk. Yeah. break a leg, break her ankle, and sued the body corporate. So what happens when you go to court? Uh, the, you know, the body corporate's there, but who's second defendant, third defendant? Well, they've added Everyone. him in as the manager and him as the director of the management company in. And the insurance policy they had at the time fell over and didn't, didn't work. So this guy, thinking he's coming up to retirement and selling the business next year, absolutely lost the plot, broke down. I, I caught up with him about nine months later and his wife brought him in. He was like comatose. He couldn't speak. Mm. It, was, it, it was just shocking to see the deterioration in this person. All was the stress that came on with this. Dragged through court for a couple of years. They ended up not having to pay anything. But basically he was, that ruined the rest of his life. And I, I've you know seen him once or twice and he just sits there He's just like in a coma. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's the, key, it's the, the key issue is um, that if you have got protection, then they're not going to come and, well, you know, they'll try, but at least it, it helps, you know, from that perspective. Oh, the, Criminal the, law is, is completely yeah. different. But in that instance, um, lawyers will go for anyone who touches anything. I mean, that's the, that's the whole thing, particularly if there's PI around it, et cetera. So it's a very debilitating um, issue, the litigation. Bankruptcy is another one that's not too bad. I know the guys at Aventum Optimum do a really good job when, when that die straights around. But again, and I'm going to show you the, the relevant bankruptcy law very shortly, uh, but really at that, that point in time, we need to ensure that we don't procrastinate. I think a lot of us get so busy on things. Um, and look, I'm, I'm the same sort of, area but you know for our clients if we're talking to them about this stuff it's important to talk and just say look we can do it for you and we can do it quickly and i think that's important to make sure you can do it quickly and that's that's what we're building the technology for is to mm -hmm. deliver these solutions but at the end of the day uh, it's also don't procrastinate or tell them not mm -hmm. to procrastinate because quite often they will and then what happens is uh, things get to a certain level all becomes as you said tim you know mm -hmm. it's all too late um yeah. a decision they could have made six months earlier now is uh, creating huge stress in life which then leads to health so bankruptcy we're going to look at what's included what's not just briefly family law there's a huge difference between matrimonial property and financial resources um, and we're going to have a look at that in terms of discretionary trusts. Um, I, I'm just going to touch on a lot of the stuff today, um, understanding that a lot of the case law um, and a lot of the sections will be going into a deep dive um, in the three-day course. But I just want to give you a heads up of the, the stuff that we need to know um, and be confident of. 
and of course challenging in a state um this is this area is going crazy um i uh i subscribe to a, a benchmark legal which uh, provides uh synopsis and discussions around various uh issues around a whole range of uh, uh legal issues and there's at least one or two sessions every couple of weeks uh, mm. just on family provisions claims. And it's quite amazing when you start to have a look at uh, what can transpire, particularly if it's in the, the wills and the estate area. So it's quite fascinating. We'll be going through a couple of really interesting ones, even the one that I showed you there, this uh, Jeremy Courtois, that's the one that we talked about. You guys should know that, the, the Millam and Taylor, which will do a deep dive, but... That was a six hundred thousand dollar estate, which really, in the terms of Australian property prices, is fairly minimal. Uh, well, not minimal, but it's not you know out there. Uh, but over five hundred thousand dollars in legal fees was spent just to get it um, through a family provision. So um, that's a that's a big area of um, of the law which is going to explode. And of course, this is where where we are is to we've got the the clients jewels in their crown, whether it's their business or whatever. And our goal is to, to build that moat as best as possible. Is anything, everything infallible? No, not at all. Um, but it's the same thing, for example, with a family allowance agreement. You know, is that is that guaranteed to ensure that your clients, uh, families are, are dependents and therefore um, you're, it's going to be tax-free, any uh, superannuation or taxable a super that goes out, um, you can't guarantee it. Uh, certainly the cases and commissioner rulings point towards it. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you don't have it, then effectively you're not gonna get it. So it's better for us to be on that proactive side and if a client wants to pay, but you know, you can't guarantee anything these days, unfortunately. And can I just say like um, what we have seen very often are accountants being excessively um, conservative mm. with trying to help their clients. And look, I get why a lot of accounts might feel this way, but at the end of the day, it's up to us to make recommendations to our clients. And what we're talking about is not stuff which is risky or illegal or anything like that. No. You're showing them stuff that is based on legislation, like the Family Allowance Agreement, that is based on case studies or legislation I would much rather be doing that for my clients, helping them to set up the play so maybe adult family members can get tax-free amounts from super. Yeah. And then you know, if the ATO does have a disagreement down the track, at least the clients are aware, look, we're on their side, we're trying to help them to get a better outcome. And, yes, there's a small chance that, you know, we might have to have a fight with the ATO, but let's do that. Now, if a client doesn't want to do that, don't do that. But... um. I think we need to make these recommendations. And um, on, on Dave interviewed an accountant from Melbourne from the trenches during the week. And, and, you know, a lot of accountants try to keep things simple to keep costs down. And this account, I love what he said. He said to the client, do you want to have things super simple but pay tax or a lot of tax? Or do you want to have things that might be more complicated and cost a little bit extra, but you're going to save heaps in tax? What would you like? Exactly. And, and clients will always say, give me a bit more complicated and I'll pay for it if I'm going to save heaps of tax. We need to give them these alternatives. So I'm glad so many on today because take what Grant's saying, offer these things to your clients. You've got to offer it to them. And look, this, this is a, look, ideally, um, this is not the, I, I'm going to, when we get to the case study, I'm going to show you a couple of different um, strategies around it. But you know what? What you got to do is, you know, if you if you had the true moat and castle, the castle would just be a family protection trust. You know, you'd have the optimal solution would be um, all the net all the the main assets are in the family protection trust, um, and then they're uh, leased out to your trading company if you're running a business. You have virtually no assets in your own name. Um, everything is just all the risk stuff is through that that trading trust or the trading company. And then you're off and running. That's the ultimate um, in business structures. But, you know, if you have a look at the, you know, the millions and millions of small businesses across Australia or structures, um, the salary and wage earners, we just, we just haven't got that. So you have to deal with what's in front of you. And that's important. Um, importantly, from here, uh, we have a look traditionally 
uh, all homes have been. I'm going to show you a solution around this to get the capital gains tax principal place of residence exemption very shortly. But primarily, most homes are either in tenants in common or joint names. Um, if you're going down this uh, PEP uh, space, generally, uh, when people have bought the home, um, you just got to be careful about that. If it is joint, um, that takes it out of the um, effectively out of the estate. Um, so you've got to be careful, although I did see in New South Wales, uh, there was a case uh, where, uh, and we'll be looking at this in the course, uh, where a family provisions claim was successful uh, on a joint asset. So again, listen to that one. Ordinarily, you would expect a joint asset. Uh, it's okay for you. Can you hold on? Just, can you just want to have a chat? I'm just going to get, get these dogs. Have a chat. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I'll let Grant come back and uh, discuss what he was talking about. But in the chat, just type in there, have any of you done the protector for yourself or for a client yet? Because this is such an important um, piece of advice to assist clients with every single one of my clients that have got equity in properties or even in businesses. We're looking at using this process to go and protect it. So Gideon, thanks. I know you're in progress at the moment with, the, with someone who've been talking with Grant about that. Yeah. Um, and look, yeah, it's what I'd recommend to everyone here is start by doing this for yourself. Think of your own situation because when you go through and you see all the docs that Grant's put together, um, when you start doing this, you'll start, you, you think of questions about certain things, how it all works. And I'm actually writing a guide as to how the financial statements for the Family Protection Trust will look like. Because every year you need to do the financials and need to match up and lock in with your other entities and that you're using. So important to do this for yourself first and then roll it out to your clients. Absolutely perfect. So you're yeah, just following on, um, just with your clients, I think if you're going down the SIPEP space, find out where that, that property resides because you may, if it's in joint names, then you're going to need to uh, gift both. Um, both parties have to be part of the gifters, and I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. Investment property is the same sort of area. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about the loan back and the registered mortgage. Um, you'll find up on our website, there's a whole um, a list of each state um, and whether you need to uh, notify the first uh, mortgagee um, in terms of uh, doing a second mortgage or registered mortgage. You can do all those through a vendor optimum as well, uh, but generally you'll find it's the loan documents from the, the bank, et cetera, which requires you to notify. But again, they don't, they don't turn you down. I mean, they've obviously got that first um, mortgage over the property anyway. Uh, but you've got shares, you've got watches, you've got a whole lot of valuables. Um, this one I saw today listed down tractors, listed down absolutely everything, uh, which is important for that uh, protection if you're using PPSR. But look, I've, I've got a simple uh, case here, which I'm going to uh, look at a little bit further. Uh, but we've got $1.6 million in, in assets there. Uh, we've got a home, which is an appreciating asset. Porsche, I'm not sure, it depends. Porsche's uh, increasing or decreasing, Tim, in terms of assets? They're definitely going up in value. All secondhand luxury and sports cars around Australia are going like this. If you try and order a new Porsche, Ferrari, something like that, you're looking at a two year wait. That's just amazing, isn't it? So the second hands are going through the roof. Well, there you go. And then you've got your shares as well, which could be appreciating or depreciating. So we've got $1.6 million there. The assets are important and look, I would encourage you, I'm not sure if Michael is coming around, but I would encourage you um, when we start looking at through everything is to get valuations on each and every one of those assets. <clears throat> if it's a watch, go to watch repairer. Um, if it's a home, I think it's pretty easy to get a valuation on that. I mean, mm. you're only going to have to have a bank valuation anyway. Shares, it's very easy. Uh, the poor should be easy as well. So... The more valuation you can get, I know uh, Michael and the team at Event Optimum can do the valuations for you. It's absolutely crucial because what you're doing there is you're substantiating that it is a um, valued transaction or as a transaction that you're doing above board. Grant, so can, I just, um, can I just answer a question yep. that um, has asked there from Roy because it leads to the point about the valuations. Roy's asked, 
under bankruptcy and similar laws, is there a four-year clawback on the gift referred to? And yeah. I know you're probably going to come back, but just to cover it off now, one of the, the docs that Grant's put in there is for me and for you as the accountant to sign off on the solvency of the client. Now, a lot of accountants often say, oh, there's bankruptcy and four-year clawback and lawyers say you can't do it and it's going to be clawed back. I just want everyone just to take away you know, the myths and fear mongering that's out there and just think, does this make logical sense? If you or your client has equity right now, if you've got a million dollars equity and you've got no credit, so you might have, you might owe the bank half a mil, but you've got another half a mil equity. That is your equity. Now, if you go and decide to gift that right now, you're allowed to do that. No mm. one can stop you from doing that. Now, if yep. a creditor comes up in 12 months' time, they can't argue that you did something 12 months earlier before this event even happened to try to defeat this creditor mm. or something in 12 months' time. That's ridiculous thinking. So the four-year clawback, yes, that is there. If you owe people money now, are in trouble, give something away, that yeah. gives you know your, your bankruptcy trustee time to go and have a look. But if you do this when you're in a situation of solvency right now, to me, there is there's virtually zero chance that can be taken back. And secondly, even if there was a situation where they, you know, there might have been a bit of doubt right now whether you owe something or whatever, still do this. Put up the barriers. Let the other side spend money to try and attack it. Yeah, I, I can't. I, I, see this Michael, what do you reckon? You know, I, I agree 100%, uh, Tim. And, uh, I mean, Rod's actually at a mediation today in Brisbane at the District or Supreme Court in relation to this. And uh, of a, But uh, the issue, and, and this was a referred uh, client, uh, not from the light year uh, membership base, but um, from a credit provider into us, and they, they hadn't recommended the strategy, but it was a, a similar, uh, and I, I passed it on to Grant, and we were discussing it briefly this morning, but they put it in when the person was actually uh, in in effect, in, had an insolvency event on the table, and uh, there are people out there who are saying that um, that, that 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 will protect. But 100, percent if you're you're completely solvent, you're not. You, there's no indication of an insolvency event happening. Then um, yeah, 100. percent You don't you don't you don't have to worry about the the four year uh, position at all. So if, you, if you're 100 percent solvent, no issue of insolvency events. Then, but then additionally. I mean, Rod's, Rod's there defending um, this person who's uh, got a gift and loan back and a, uh, a trust position in place. And he said that whilst um, it, uh, he, he's coming from a position of weakness because it was put in while she was in an insolvent event, um, it, it is also adding a layer of protection. And then that's what he'll be arguing today, that it actually, uh, this, that, that it is in place and uh, that uh, there is a protection mechanism in there. So it'll be interesting to see where he gets to at five o'clock this afternoon in relation to but yeah definitely it, that was a different one they were, they were in a position in insolvency they were instructed to utilize a gift and loan back uh which doesn't if, if that sort of events in place or is about to happen then we wouldn't be using it actually i had a look through the documentation there and um it was interesting. There was a lot missing wasn't it it wasn't even a deed of gift and no yeah but <laughs> the, the, yeah, they talked about the family it. protection trust if there's no did yeah. it was just yeah. like an equitable mortgage that just floats out of you know God's gift and floats yeah. over everything. Just... And, and, and no, no valuation or ability no. to know what the equity is that's supposedly been gifted by no gift mechanism. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's important that um, with all of this uh, that you are dealing with um, some of the smartest people around this area. Um, who do this day in and day out. So we put a lot of thought into it. And the first iteration that we came up with is well and truly beyond because you'll see as we go down the track, there is that gift over, but we're not going to transfer the assets over directly. Um, if we've got, for example, if you're using the business protector where Tim's been talking about, you know, your trading company, your risk assets, Sure, you can use potentially the small business concession rules or the, you know, the fifty percent discount to transfer uh, those assets over into the family protection trust, um, and then um, lease them back or license them back to your your trading entity. But you just want to cover what's important about valuations, Michael, while we're here. Yeah, it's 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 important in relation to valuations that. Um, 
it's a what would be considered to be a commercial and market valuation. So I know I know Tim uses has a similar uses a similar service that we do have access to in relation to what I would call as a debt in particular about property. So desktop assessments, uh, desktop valuations. Um, you can then you can go you can go to the next level as well and obviously get. Um, external uh, valuation. So that's the initial thing is desktop assessment, which will meet the requirements. So it allows you to um, obviously assess what the value of the asset is, assess what the equity is, if there's a first uh, mortgage in place and, um, and also allow you to account for the value once you um, account for it in, in terms of the family protection trust or, or a trust that you're taking it up in. Um, so we, we can provide that service in relation to um, Property valuations. We can also, and also, obviously, business valuations, um, car valuations. You can use Redbook. Uh, we utilise Redbook, but you can get that service through us. It's all in the one, um, the one service that we utilise for mortgage registrations and uh, caveats and second mortgages and everything. So, and I think, um, as I said, that's absolutely crucial because you want to make sure you're on the the, the top side. You have got the valuation, and you're not going to transfer the assets in unless you can uh, do it stamp duty or cgt free yeah uh, it'll be backed by a promissory note um, and then that goes over to the family protection trust so that becomes the current asset of that family protection trust now one of the issues when we first did it and for those of you who have done the protected before you probably need to go back and just tweak it a bit is that a loan went out but nothing went out with the loan so it's like this vaporware almost so what we've done is the promissory note going in is then transferred back out to the issuer which are your clients and essentially what happens there is uh, that transfer back um, is called an endorsement at law it's like a check so for example if michael writes me a check for ten thousand dollars which he should because he's such a nice guy mm. and then i say well, but i owe tim ten thousand dollars then i can endorse that check to tim um, and that satisfies that that debt so that's an endorsement that's so we've built that into the process um, and then obviously when you have the, the loan, you go through the registered mortgages, the PPSR through Venom Optimum, and then you're off and running. The big issue that we do need, and I really need to, you to focus in on this, is what is the line of succession? So, for example, let's say we've got Tommy as the main person in there. Um, if there's litigation, uh, family law or other issues, Tommy needs to bail out of there. And that's fairly important because the way we've set up that family protection trust is that once Tommy bails out there, he can be a, a secondary beneficiary, but he's no longer primary beneficiary, no longer a pointor and no longer trustee. He has absolutely no control of that family protection trust. If you're setting it up in order to protect from a family law perspective, then you shouldn't have it for Tommy, then you don't have Tommy in there in the first place. You need to have someone else in there and that's crucial. So when you come around and having a look at that purpose, you know, feel free to, to contact us and, and we'll tell you how to line it. But that lineup of a succession is absolutely crucial. The other new one that you're gonna see very shortly when I bounce into there is um, some of these assets, as Tim said, the Porsche's going up. Someone asked about a crisis, or I don't know about crisis, where they go up, I think I've got a, I used to have a Valiant and if I had that now, it'd be, you know, the charge would be worth a fortune. But homes are also increasing. Remember, this is the net equity on it. So um, the, the big issue that I was always faced with was well, what happens if there's an increasing um, uh, price going up? So does it mean you have to continuously do a gift loan back? And uh, absolutely, you'd have to do that. But what we've done is we've added a, a call option so the trustee of the Family Protection Trust um, can have a call option over each of these assets for the market value and effectively just pay a dollar for that call option because you're acquiring at market value. That then picks up um, all the upside, uh, which is important, which will end up in the Family Protection Trust, but it also means you've paid full consideration for that, which is important. So when we go down to bankruptcy, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we will be doing a lot of this in the course, but section 116 um, essentially protects uh, monies in superannuation. Um, if you taking monies out as a lump sum, effectively they are also protected from the trustee in bankruptcy. 
uh, there's no quantum there. So there's not a million dollars or, you know, half a million or whatever. Whatever you take is excluded uh, as an exempt asset under section 116. If you take a pension though, um, effectively pensions are to be treated as your income and the trustee in bankruptcy will just form part of your income and uh, they'll be able to look at that. Uh, the clawback, I was going to, if I had time, I would take you into the legislation itself, but uh, we will be looking at that uh, during the course. Uh, but section 120 uh, provides that it's, if it's an undervalued transaction, you know, quite clearly a gift is an undervalued transaction, um, but as Tim noted, we can gift to anything. And I think, I think a gift is actually God's gift to accountants and all of us. Um, however, if um, you're solvent at the time, it's a four-year um, clawback. Um, and if it's unrelated, then it's uh, essentially uh, two years. But again, if we have a look at practical circumstances, we've set this up, it's great. But the worst case, I mean, if, you, if you're advising a client, you've got the solvency, just say, look, there's no issues here at the moment. We should put this in place while the going gets good because you never know what comes down the track. It's interesting too, uh, Grant, um, Craig um, Collins has put a thing. So just to, it's a, mate, when, as you go through that process, ensure tax fares are clean and up to date. There's no undisclosed CGT events or unquestionable tax transactions. I've mentioned that, yeah, that's correct. And any, uh, I guess, uh, contingent liabilities and things. So it's, a, it's important that uh, when you're making those solvency that, that you actually, you know, the financials are up to date and you ha have checked that there's no undisclosed or unknown tax, 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 uh, events as well so you've got to go through the process it's not a matter of just signing a solvency isn't this uh, isn't, isn't this perfect i mean this is like yeah, the it perfect is. product it and strategy for an account perfect. because exactly you're getting, your family, you're getting a yeah. family protection trust to administer each year you're doing your valuations you're making mm. sure that you've got all this so that's Keep why your lawyers card. can't, yeah, lawyers can't yeah. deal with it and like the one that you were talking about today that rod's dealing with you can't deal with it. So it's a perfect product for you guys. Um, the one that Tim was talking about is um, any transfer, if you're about to become insolvent, any transfer can be clawed back. So essentially, this is why it's important to do it when it's in a good position. Um, likewise, if we go back and have a look at um, the transfer of the option agreement, would that be voidable transaction? I would say not because you paid actually full value, quick market value for that. But anyway, I'll have a look at that. We've talked about valuations. Um, the, the actual process for the protector um, is establishing the leading member trust. Um, and all of this is done in one line, which I'll show you um, shortly. One thing we can't do in that uh, interview yet, we will be able to do it a little bit later when we get to Lightyear Docs 2, which is are currently underway, looks, yeah, looks fantastic, um, is if you can set up the leading member discretionary trustee company first. So once you do that, then everything's underway. So then we establish the trust. I'll show you how to do that. The account solvency certificate, the deed of cash gift from the client to the trust, and cash equals a promissory note. So we back that with a promissory note. And then we're going to lend that cash back. So what we do is we're lending the a promissory note back, so it's an endorsement there. Mortgage deed and mortgage deed and personal guarantee. Um, Venom Optimum will come and do the registration, the mortgage and the PPSR, and then obviously we've got the trustee call option. So that what happens if we go through a call option? Um, and I'll just take you through the process. Um, if we got a home here worth a million dollars, and we're going to buy that's the current market value. I've got a call option of the trustee. And this now goes up to $1.6 million and it's subsequently sold, um, then effectively six some part will go back by way of the loan funds. The rest will actually go back by way of settlement proceeds directly into that family protection trust, uh, which is the payout of a call option. So I actually like the call option as a, as a better value transaction than the, the uh, gift and loan back. In terms of family law, I won't go into a lot. Again, we'll spend more time on this. Uh, in terms of the course, but we'll be going through each of these cases. But suffice to say, uh, when it comes down to matrimonial property versus financial resources, matrimonial property, if the court is able to declare the whole family trust, 
um, as being matrimonial property, then it's all included and, and uh, everything's sliced and diced from there. Otherwise, it's just the income um, that you receive by way of distributions. So you'll see Cannon and Spry was a fairly, in fact, it's a very convoluted case. Um, and even there was a lot of dissension sitting in the high court. So the main thing though is um, uh, the court there looked through upgrades, et cetera, and went back. But it was, um, I, I think they were actually a bit out to get Dr. Spry, who was a QC. So I think he probably rubbed a few people up the wrong way. But when we have a look at some of the other cases, you know, 2012, even 2020, um, good things there is that it really comes down to control. Uh, a mother controlled the trust. So again, the succession level, uh, she was the appointor and the trustee so that the family trust couldn't be uh, latched onto for uh, family law purposes. Um, two brothers controlled the trust in terms of Morton and Morton. And likewise, that was held uh, the family trust assets were sacrosanct. Uh, the better ones for us, though, is definitely uh, when we go down generations. So we're looking at children being part of that family protection trust um, that uh, in McDowell and William uh, weren't able to look at mother's trust at all in terms of uh, at, at all or the mother's will in terms of family law. Um, the same thing with the father's family trust, even though 40% of the um, distribution of income was more of a fixed trust was to go to uh, the son who was being divorced. Um, they couldn't latch on to the family trust. They could just uh, latch on to that income going to the son. So family law, it's about control. So that, again, you're going to have to have a look at succession. The same with litigation. It's about control. If a client looks as though they're going to become solvent, then the whole idea is to peel off that, fan, that leading member trust importantly. Um, if we then go through family provisions, I won't spend a lot of time here, but eligible persons are a spouse, an ex-spouse, um, a former spouse can claim, child, um, anyone who's in a de facto relationship, um, a grandchild um, or any other member of the household, uh, essentially, have seen a family friend who is living with them, uh, being able to make a claim in uh, New South Wales recently. And it's quite a detailed process. So we go through a family provisions claim. It's a very expensive process because it's at least three days to a week in court um, with a SC, um, you know, a whole coterie of solicitors. Before you get there, you'll probably end up with about half a dozen adjournments, et cetera. So you're looking at a family provisions claim. It's probably going to cost that minimum um, two hundred to $300,000. So it's quite a and, solid. And I actually did that for my mum. My yeah. mum wasn't given money under her mother's will and because my mum's brother, who's not alive now, was an alcoholic and yeah. he did the wrong thing by her. And so he managed to get her will changed unfairly. So others in the family did. So I know this whole process actually went through it and helped mum to recover something from her mother's estate. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite fascinating. One of the family provisions claims I looked at recently um, Dad had left everything um, to his eldest son. Uh, he'd been estranged from his daughter for 30 years. And, of course, what they do is they go through a subjective basis to see, you know, how close they are and all that. And you would have thought, hope in hell, that this daughter would have got a cracker out of it. Um, and she was only awarded $10,000. And you'll actually see, for those of you who have seen our will, we can exclude people or limit them, and we're going to put in a lot more explanation where... Clients can put in explanations around that in the wills, uh, but she ended up with hundred thousand dollars up from ten thousand, even though she, you know, parents really didn't like her and all of that stuff. But anyway, it just shows you that um, the scary thing about it, the beautiful thing about the family protection trust, is they they're essentially protected from family provisions claims, uh, and essentially from from that perspective, uh, we're in a in a good position because if you can't make a family provisions claim, then uh, the no win, no fee lawyers aren't going to really get into it. So let's just have a look at this uh, case study, just pretty short. Um, so we've got John, uh, John Smith, who's on his second marriage. Um, his children uh, don't like his uh, current wife. Uh, eldest has threatened to challenge any will. So as soon as you look at that, I mean, obviously there's family protection issues. You'd be so surprised at um, how many of your clients have probably gone through a very nasty divorce and you know, they really want to make sure that their assets are protected for their for their bloodline. 
Uh, you're the Smith business, which is run through Smith Enterprises, doing well. It's got great cash flow, uh, but it's in hospitality, so we don't know what's coming down the track. So again, you know, it's best to do these sort of things now. John's currently buying a house in his own name to ensure the CGT exemption, so he doesn't want to go joint with his second wife. He'll own it completely, has a million dollar investment property um, portfolio with a $300,000 loan, which is also sitting in his own name, so he get negative gearing. He's got money in Australian super, he's age 55, um, and recently he had all the assets valued for bank loan purposes because he's currently buying a house. Uh, one strategy that I'm working with one of our advisors on is uh, that we can buy that uh, property directly in the trust itself. So setting up the Family Protection Trust. Uh, and then there's a private binding ruling, which um, we've got access to, which enables a long-term lease um, going back to, for example, John. If this was me at the moment, John going through buying a house, I would actually set up the Family Protection Trust and get him to buy the house within that trust um, and then doing a long-term peppercorn lease to him. Um, in fact, the, you don't really need to do much more. The commission tells you exactly what to do. Um, and then at the end of the lease, if they sell the property, because he's got a long-term lease, uh, to break that lease, uh, the lessee um, can receive a surrender payment. Uh, and that surrender payment, um, the receipts or the proceeds of it, uh, essentially will be the value of the, the property itself, uh, less obviously any uh, loans, and that will be treated as um, effectively a, a CGT exempt amount of principal place of residence exemption. So we'll look at that, but we'll assume we've got that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna bounce out of here, um, and I did this a little bit um, uh, earlier today, uh, just to save time, uh, but you can see here I've done the protector too. Uh, there's a couple of other ones that are coming on. Uh, Tony is, has drafted up a letter on the protector, which will also be included very shortly. But the protector too is ready to go. So for those of you who have already done a, a protector for your class, uh, for your clients, effectively you probably should go back and update to at least put the endorsement in. Um, and if you want, go through and uh, essentially insert the call option as well, which, I, as I said before, I think the, the call option is probably one of the best ones there. Uh, and it's also not a bad idea incentivizing as well, um, you know, family members uh, getting that upside. So you can see here, this is the uh, modern protector. Uh, it's now released. Um, I have to update the website and the discussion. Uh, but you can see there we've got John Smith case study. We've got the Abbott Morley logo. Uh, the common parties, I've got John Smith um, there. I've got the uh, company that I've set up, uh, which is going to be the trustee of the Family Protection Trust. So that's Smith Protection Proprietary Limited. When you set that up, because it's a leading member um, style, um, you need to make sure that John is the sole director. Um, and is also, well, he can let um, his uh, spouse... Uh, Kate uh, in there as a director, uh, but John has the is the sole shareholder, which is really important. So we've set that up, and again, if you if you're not really sure what to do, use this little support ticket coming down here, and more than happy to uh, cover off any issues. Kate Smith is his spouse, so uh, and then we've got Max, who's the eldest um, son. So we've got all of that, we've put all the details in, and then I've got the documents. So do you want to establish a trust? Yes, so that's going to be a family protection trust. Do we want to set up a company? No, um, essentially you've obviously set the company up before. Uh, we haven't got this yet, as I said, with Lightyear Docs too, um, we'll be able to uh, put that in. When's, uh, when's the estimate on that uh, being released, Michael? Because I know you're a lot closer than, than myself. Lightyear's, uh, what, 2.0? Yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're working um, each day with the development team and stuff. It's probably, uh, to be honest, you know how, how, how these things take. Right. It's probably th three months, um, I, I would think. so. Maybe four months, yeah. So yeah, I, I know. Did I, I, I know say three months is probably five months. Yeah, so um, yeah, I know we were promising it up around about May, but I yeah. was is we this time we had to do unlike with this uh, program which is you know virtually 20 years old we've had to do a lot of due diligence to enable 
uh, when you guys do fact finds or data captures where your client it comes and pre-populates itself, mm -hmm. uh, integrated with ASIC, um, with Zero, Zero Practice Manager. Uh, There's another, the boss, we're all, yeah, also the front end. It's not, it's not just the, um, I guess, the document engine and the document creator and the strategy creator. It's uh, the whole front end we're doing. So it's a whole new um, look and feel, whole new branding, which looks amazing, Grant, Grant, doesn't it? And it's also, um, we've got a new private client um, uh, portal, which you'll go into um, similar to um, what you, you know, it's like a change here with GPS and um, that you, you'd go into and then uh, everything's in there. There's a community in there, um, strategy, uh, the ability to, um, where, where we've got our Zen desk support now, everything can be done in there. It's um, and it, and it's also available not only uh, on your web browser but your phone and stuff. So and you'll be able to discuss and talk documents and annotate them and everything. It's um, it's it's quite quite special what's coming out. What we've got, I think. What while I got you and I'll just mm -hmm. go through. Um, I, I know we're going through a capital raising, which is extremely popular at the moment yes. given our awards and all that stuff but if anyone wants to to get involved at all um to just contact you yeah if you can contact me at michael at lightyeardocs.com.au it's, it's a i mean the group uh what, what are we 18 months down the track now a little bit more than that grant and we're um cash flow positive um we're um uh, to the point where we're profitable we'll be in the next ball well, towards the end at probably at this financial year, but definitely next financial year, membership growing. You know, we, we went out with a soft launch. Our membership is growing and growing and growing. We've got a lot of great opportunities and sales opportunities in that space. Like your docs 2.0 coming out. A number of competitors have sold, you know, 25 to 30 million. And one, one, one was 102 or 104 million that had US mm. traction, which we'll be um, potentially looking at with the, the living, uh, Will's Living Trust. And, um, you know, we're the... I'm to, up to the point where I'm closely to, I'm getting to oversubscribe now, but um, which is great, and that's just on expressions of interest. But um, there'll be an offer document out, um, uh, a short short form offer document, because uh, it's uh, the third and final tranche we'll do, ever do an opportunity to get in. But it's only gone to existing shareholders, but I'm certainly happy to uh, speak to anyone as else if there's interest. Absolutely. Um, so, question: uh, As you can see, the stuff that we've got. If you look at Martin Castle. And this is, you know, it's very hard for anyone to, to um, you know, build this sort of stuff. And we're more about building strategies for accountants and financial planners. So if you haven't, if you've done a protective before for a client, just go in, relaunch. If you just need to do the endorsement of promissory note and call option, and it just tick those boxes. That's all you have to do. But I'm going to do the whole box and dice here just to take you through. Um, so uh, we've got the account, uh, we've got the name of the accountant there. Um, so there's a solvency certificate. Um, the gifter I've got is John James. Um, so that's uh, obviously the property, et cetera. And we'll have a look at that um, a little bit later on. Uh, the giftee is obviously the Smith Family Protection Trust. And again, um, you know, with a company I've just chosen the selected party. And that you don't have to, you know, type in all of this. It just happens. Um, you just need to click a few buttons. So I've worked out the value after all debt is 2.56 million. And I'll just put that it's cash, but it's by way of a promissory note, which is a, equivalent to cash. It's the same as a check. So I'm paying over 2.56 million um, across there, um, but it's by way of a promissory note. So we need to do a deed of promissory note. Uh, so we've got a, and I'll show you what it looks like. Um, and then, so that's John, who's the promissor. The promise is obviously the Family Protection Trust. Uh, Tim's going to be doing all the accounting for it as well, so I'll include that in there. But where it's just payable on demand, uh, which is is important, uh, so much the same as if you're making you can make a contribution to super by way of a promissory note, as long as it's payable on demand. We got the promise details: two point five six million, so nothing there. Now, um, when we have a look here. Um, uh, we've got the, the you'll see here, this is a new one. Um, so when you come around to the endorsement, uh, you'll see there the date, the deed of endorsement, the promissory note is executed. So you generally want to have, can you see there, you want to receive it. So when you're linking it up, you're receiving the cash. So this is going to be a current asset in the balance sheet of the 
Family Protection Trust, it's received on the 27th of May. The next day you're gonna lend it out, but what you're doing is you're endorsing the cash out. So you wanna give yourself a day then just so it hits. So when that goes out, um, you'll have, I don't, you guys are probably better at me than entries, but the promissory note will go out um, and then instead the, um, the loan will place that uh, current assets. So buy a non-current asset, I think, which is the loan. Uh, so we've got the promise details. We've got the lender there. So it's the Family Protection Trust. Uh, the borrower is John. And what I've done is I've just been a bit mean. I'm actually throwing Kate in as well as the borrower, uh, just in case there's a divorce or something. So I've pulled, John's the only one with assets, so I've given it over, but I've made them both accountable for the borrowing. So it's important. Uh, the engraver details, I've done a 50-year loan. Um, and then you can see, someone asked me the other day, what happens if I'm doing a back-to-back -back loan agreement? Then you can actually put in there, for example, um, this is a fixed loan, a Westpac fixed home loan rate for 50 years. Um, and then you just got to put in your relevant amount there. So let's say it's, you know, $1,200 per month. Uh, and I'll put that in there. So uh, interest only, um, you can capitalise it if you want. Um, is the guarantor, if you want to do a personal guarantee, yes. Uh, date of the mortgage deed, uh, probably leave that until next week. Uh, so we've got the real estate, other assets. We put our other assets in there. I've got a Mercedes AMG C43. I think it's the one you've got that one, Michael, I think. Um, uh, I think, think yeah. I've got a, um, a, a, a four drive for E-class. Oh, very nice, sweet. Yeah. So we've got the we've got the property there. We've got um, first off is the the property is about to buy, and we've got an investment property in Maroochydore apartment um, there. We've got the other uh, investment property down at, at Burley, and then we've got the call option. So we've got the date of the call option D going through New South Wales, um, and then we'll just put let's say it's a hundred dollars for the call option D. Now, when you go through, it says, is the option hold the lender? Um, you just put in there, yes. Is the property owner, uh, which is the, the obviously giving the option, uh, the borrower, and then you go, uh, yes, there. Um, so, um, uh, so then we go through each of the assets there, um, and then you just put in the amount that they're going to be. So let's say it's 250 there. Storage shed is, um, let's say seventy thousand uh, dollars there. Um, One point five five um, there. Um, Three hundred there, and then I think it's fourteen. I'm not sure about whether that all matches up, but anyway, we go through that process, uh, and that's it. So it's effectively all done for you. Uh, and then we'll go and have a look at the documentation uh, for the next couple of minutes, and then. Um, I can get you guys on your way. But There's again, a couple of interesting quick questions there, Grant. What just um, Phil has said, if uh, completed protector, so protector, let's call them one or 1.0, 1 uh, do, does he have to rerun the documents for clients to sign or just update for the call option? Yeah, no, you just, all you do is just go in and just tick the endorsement of the promissory note and the call option, and that's all. And yep. then that's all they have to sign at that day. So, that's so you said you effectively just re, you just do the relaunch, do you? And then just uh, yeah. tick that off. Yeah. You just, just those two. So you only need to tick those two buttons rather than the yep. whole lot. Because you've already signed everything. So you're just enhancing it. That's so the account statement of financial solvency we had a look at. So you just sign off there. Uh, you got the deed of gift. Um, obviously, from James to um, the Family Protection Trust. I won't go down into that to any great extent. So I've got the deed of gift. You've got a schedule, the 2.56 promissory note. Then we've got the call option deed um, there. So that's the um, John and Kate, who actually are the, the property owners. Uh, from, their, from that perspective, you've got the Smith Family Protection Trust is now the option holder. Uh, when you go through that, you'll see that um, we've got a whole uh, lot of property. So it's a good, strong option deed there. Uh, what happens in there, nominees, and then we go through into the schedule. Uh, you've got the property, you've got the all the prices, et cetera, and the, the option price is actually um, further up. But that's essentially what you're buying that property for. Uh, the premium for the option was $100. 
we go the deed of promissory note, which is the transfer over. Um, then what we do is we then um, do the loan agreement, uh, which then goes through and uh, you'll see there, then there's a um, endorsement. Uh, we've endorsed the promissory note back. Um, and then we go into, I think it's the personal guarantee. We then go into the uh, mortgage deed. And you can see there is all the properties. I think we've actually got, um, not that, that Michael needs it, but uh, we've actually got the pre-prepared uh, because for all the Queensland ones, we've got the pre-prepared uh, registration of mortgage deeds there as well. So you can actually see there it's quite complex. Just when, when, when you are registering all those and mortgages and stuff, they're, 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 that's with the national mortgage form. You actually have to have to, for each, each state, crazily enough, is different, the national mortgage form, and it's called the national mortgage form, that you have to have um, uh, terms and conditions for a mortgage attached. Often you'll see when you've got your first, then Westpac or ANZ will have their terms and condition to meet the national mortgage code. But um, the terms and conditions for a first or second when you're using the protector is effectively the mortgage um, or the loan uh, uh, deed under the uh, protector. So that attaches as a annexure to the, the back of that national mortgage form. And you have, actually have to sign every single, um, all parties have to sign uh, the, each page of those terms and condition. And, and it has to be na named on that uh, NMC form that or national mortgage form that it's um, an annexure. And you have to have those terms and conditions or it can't be lodged. Uh, Roy's also come in. I think this is for, for you, Tim. Um, apologies if a dumb question. There, there's, Roy, there's never ever a dumb question. I can tell you mm -hmm. that. What was the journal and the trust when receiving the deed of gift for 2.56, which is just cash? Mm -hmm. That'd go right. with current asset, wouldn't it? Yeah, as you described earlier, there's, there's two steps. One is a promissory note is like cash. Mm -hmm. So I would have something that says cash dash promissory note. 2.56 mil. And then yeah. the credit entry would be in the equity side, gifts to trust 2.56 mil, because it's a gift into the trust. And then the next day, when you convert the promissory note into a loan, credit, cash, cash, promissory note, and then debit, current asset or non current, whatever, of the 2.56 loan to whoever the individual is. Yeah. Actually, uh, Lloyd's brought up a really good position. And and again, I, I just hark back to where we started um, here is that when we are building this, there's four areas that we're looking at. Um, and each one, the way you build it is going to be quite separate. So you saw me, I was a bit sneaky panda there by adding, although all the assets were in John's name, I also pulled Kate in as a borrower, which is obviously going to have an impact from a family law perspective. But I would agree there that it's probably not a bad idea um, for Kate to go and get independent legal advice in case it um, comes back a little bit later on. Uh, but that's a good question. But the way you said it, remember, if it's family law um, and it's a potential issue coming up shortly, um, in fact, I dealt with this the other day with a client, I said, you need to tell me exactly what your relationship is like now. Um, because it's going to be different in the way we set up that succession plan. The same with the, the bankruptcy and, and obviously family provisions isn't to any great extent. But look, that's uh, protected too. Um, Tim, uh, do you want to, did you put details in relation to our trustee week, which I think is going to be super, super exciting? I've posted it once. I'm just, I've actually got a light year um, docs uh, link. For, and I'll show this through there, but there's the details there. Um, I've already seen some online today. I've already registered on that, so that's fantastic. We're going to have a, a brilliant week. Hopefully I can finish the week, Grant, maybe with a lunch with yourself and Michael afterwards. Absolutely. And, yeah. We'll go to that We're looking Mexican forward to it. What's that Mexican restaurant in Brisbane? I love that. Oh, Community Cantina. Well, I'll yeah. make a booking for that for after... After this finishes, yeah, that was actually good. There's, a, there's actually a really good link on uh, the Change GPS website for the Deej week, isn't there, Tim? Yeah, there is. And, and make, uh, make sure really that, good. yeah, make sure you also, um, if you've got the time to come along, at least register for the session, which is next Wednesday, uh, on the 2nd of June, when I bring out um, the contributions or the prepayment of contributions. I'm going to thank John Ipolini for that. 
in terms of instead of talking about things like contributions to Spence account, um, a prepayment sounds a great idea. So it's a lot easier to cut through all the stuff and the more we can communicate with the client, the better. And of course, don't, don't forget, um, get on that course because a lot of the stuff I'm doing today is I've read those cases, so I sort of understand what I'm doing. But when we go through and look at the nuances of what the High Court's saying here or family provisions, it'll really give you that confidence. And that's, that's what it's all about. Um, we want to meet those competency standards so that you are comfortable in the advice that you're giving. But anyway, look, look I really appreciate um, both Michael and also Tim coming on. As I said, we're creating all of these uh, amazing things and you know, we're all, all in this together and I think it's a very exciting um, area that we're working into and really appreciate your time and make sure you support the Venom Optimum and, of course, uh, Change GPS as well. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for today and uh, we'll catch up with you later. Thanks, Tim, and thanks, Matt. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Okay, bye.